Our next presenter is Robin Summer, and he will be presenting uh, Following the Packets, a Walkthrough Bro's Internal Processing Pipeline. Welcome, Robin. Thanks, Jeanette. Um, so maybe a quick introduction for those who don't know me. So I've, been, I've had the pleasure to, to lead the Bro team for a few years now. Um, that's with my ICSI head on in, in Berkeley, and I'm also now the uh, CTO of, of Corelite. So the idea for this talk um, was to, to talk a little bit more about the Bro internal. So how does the, the general data flow inside Bro work? And I realized this morning when I was looking at the agenda that I managed to have a title which is longer than the abstract. <laughs> so I think I, I never got to update the abstract in the agenda. I apologize for that. So, um, but basically, I want to um, take Bro's architecture, which is this, this, this diagram I think uh, many of you have seen with the two layers of the event engine and the scripting layer. And I, um, dig a little bit more into what's going on there, and then also focus on, on a few components in a bit more detail. Um, don't be worried. I, I don't go into like source code stuff. I've already heard some people hoping for that. Um, but I'll stay ma mainly at the architectural level. So this is this um, basic bro architecture diagram, right, which, which uh, we saw it yesterday, and it's, it's already in the original paper. And um, the, the basic model is that when the packets are coming out of the network, they feed into the event engine. The event engine does a lot of magic to produce events, which are the key steps of, of network activity. And then you write your event handlers in ProScript land to um, implement whatever you are looking for at that point. So um, let's look at this event engine part in more detail. So it all starts, if you look at the source code, it all starts with a packet source. And a packet source is essentially the, the code which gets the, 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 the network traffic out of whatever API you have on the system. So usually that is, that is PCAP, but we have packet sources for, for NetMap these days, for PFRing, um, AF packet. Um, so there's a variety of things you can kind of attach to uh, from Bro's perspective to, to pull the packets out. And then uh, a packet source, once it gets a packet, it feeds it into Bro's I.O. loop, which is kind of the main um, multiplexing loop inside um, the event engine where um, everything happens and then kind of diverts into, into different paths. And for packets at that point, um, the first thing that happens is, is look up into the session table to see if we already know the connection this, package, uh, this packet is, is, is part of. And um, if it's not, if it's the first time we see a packet for this connection, we instantiate a new connection instance. And there's a connection class. And, and this connection class then for all subsequent packets belonging to the same connection will kind of take charge of their processing. And all further processing happens like within this almost container and the status maintained on a, on a per connection level. So once we have a connection, um, the protocol parsing starts, right? And that is where the, 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 the previous talk kind of fits in. So, so we, we bro has a bunch of protocol analyzers. It starts digging into this, this payload and, and, and getting the interesting stuff out. Um, after protocol analysis, some of these um, protocols transfer files. So we have kind of a similar pipeline for file analysis, um, which happens then. So and um, at this point, in general, things go like to the, to the left side into the event stream, but I'll, I'll make a little bit of a detour because there's one more component here that is uh, Bro's signature engine, which um, not everybody may even know that, it, that Bro has a signature engine in the, in the snort sense, in the Suricata sense. Um, and you can give Bro like these, these, these parents to watch for out in traffic, and it's fed from both the protocol analysis and from the file analysis. So both of them send raw data in there, so you can do pattern matching on the raw data if you want. Um, you can also get access to some of the past data already. For example, URLs, um, so you can write a signature matching on a URL just as you would do in Snort. Um, all these components, the protocol analysis, file analysis, signature engine, so they all generate events. And that is what they then feed into this, this single event queue, which Bro has internally, where everything is queued up and then sent upstream. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about the event model itself in, 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 in a couple of minutes. Um, before I go on to script land, there's one additional piece here, and that is um, internally Bro has a lot of timers. Timers is stuff which gets scheduled at some point to be done in the future. And, and um, when the timer expires, it generates events again, they get into the event queue and you get informed about it. Um, and Bro potentially kind of like, like tens of thousands of timers uh, concurrently instantiated. And the most uh, typical example there is, is like 
stuff associated with connections. So if, if a connection, for example, begins, but um, Bro might, in some cases, Bro never sees the end of a connection. So sometimes the, just the fin packets never come for whatever reason. So it needs to still time out the state at some point. So what it does with the very first packet is it, it, it schedules a timer into the future. And at that point when that fires, um, and it looks like the connection might still be ongoing, but you haven't seen a, any data in a while, it will expire the state. And that will generate an event so that you know about it. So there are lots of these timers feeding into the event queue as well. So once we have events, um, that is where actually the this, this step to script land is being done. And then you write your, your, your event handlers in, in, in Bro's language and, and react based on that. And for that you have, um, well, a scripting language at your disposal, right? And that if you look at the code, I'm not going into this in, 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 in detail, but if you look at the code, you have all the, the, the classes you would expect. There's a module, functions, expressions, statements, values, types, so it's, it's a full language you have um, an interpreter for at that point. Um, once event handlers have done their job, they, they've done their analysis, they, they, they usually want to convey results in some form, right? So they want to, want to log it. They want to send an email notification. So for that, there needs to be way out of script length, uh, script length back into your, your system. And that goes kind of um, the other way, down back into the event engine, where there's additional functionality to now do something. And, and the most common thing is the log manager, managing all those log files coming out of Pro. So, so there's one log stream per, um, per well, log file, I guess. And, um, the, 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 the script, um, the script generating these logs just call a function write log. This, this, this function is a, a so-called built-in function. That is this, this BIF um, abbreviation you might be seeing if you have been looking over the code a bit. Um, and, and, and BIFs are really, this really kind of the glue between script land and event land. Um, just as if you, I don't know, if you have a, if you want Python bindings for a C library, you write, need, need to write kind of this, this, this boilerplate code. And, and this is what the BIF elements in, in Bro are taking. Um, taking that role. So you have BIFs for writing logs, right? And there's um, another set of BIFs for communicating with other Bro instances or external application. That is um, Bro's communication framework, which uh, I guess for historical reasons is a bit oddly named. It's, it's internally, it's called the remote serializer, um, but it's really basically Bro's communication framework. Um, this this uh, communication framework receives events itself potentially from, from other Bro's feeds them back into the event queue, um, and they go up again into script land um, to be processed. It also interfaces with the I.O. loop. It's kind of a different thing, kind of feeding into this, this central loop of, of uh, activity going on. There's one specific thing about the, the remote serializer slash communication system, and that is it's actually not doing the I.O load itself, it's, it's spawning a separate process. And that is, if, if you're running Bro, you, you pretty much always see two processes running, uh, even if you start it only once. And the second process, that's the one which is at nice level five, uh, so a little bit nicer, um, that is actually doing the communication. And it's communicating with, uh, with the main process through a pipe. So there's a little bit of concurrency there, kind of old style concurrency. Um, and maybe the third component here for like, like script land controlling event engine back is, is the input manager for the input framework. So if you want to read data into, into broad runtime, um, like large Intel list, things like that. And, and again, this feeds back into the event queue. It can actually also feed directly into script land in some cases by, by filling tables. Um, I, haven't, I don't have that arrow in here. Um, an interesting thing about this, this log manager and the input manager is that they are actually, there's actually real concurrence here in terms of threads here. So broad, generally it's still mostly most of Bro's, Bro's um, operation still happens in a single thread. Um, but the I.O. Um, happens separately. That is the case for the remote serializer. But um, for the log manager and the input manager, they spawn threads um, to do stuff. For example, the, lo the, the log manager spawns a single thread for each log stream. So if you um, go into top and, and I don't know what's on Linux, I think it's type H or something. So you'd see actually the, the breakdown of processes by threads. You will see lots of threads. Um, one per log stream, and that's the log manager handling these. And the input manager does the same for like the opposite way. And the thread manager kind of hooks back into the I/O loop. So this is kind of um, the main data flow um, control flow inside the event engine through script land and back. I want to talk a bit more about um, 
couple components. So first, basically this, this part here, which is the connection processing uh, protocol analysis, file analysis. So, and, and let's break that down a bit further. So um, internally, Bro instantiates analyzers for um, protocols and files. So one per protocol, essentially. So we have the IP analyzer, which starts parsing um, kind of the lowest level if we ignore the, the Mac layer. And then um, in, the IP, in the IP packet, you see, well, this is, this is a TCP packet, actually. So it instantiates the TCP analyzer on top, feeds the data in there. And this is where kind of the first in some simplification. Um, the first event is generated that once the TCP analyzer sees the, the three-way handshake being completed, it generates the first event, the connection established, and then kind of goes up into the event queue, script land, and you can, you can work on that. Um, it then adds the application layer analyzer on top of the TCP analyzer. So in the application layer analyzer starts processing um, this protocol. In this case, I'm using SSL as an example, and um, at some point, it will kind of see the, the, the handshake being completed, and it generates these, these SSL um, client hellos and server hellos events into the event queue up to script land. And then if there's an X509 certificate, for example, um, in the SSL session, um, you get the same, get the file analysis to kick in and extract the certificate and, and, and send that upstream. Um, there's one kind of critical decision in here. So how, so going from TCP to SSL, how does Bro know um, that this is actually SSL? And traditionally, you would look at the ports, but you all know that, that ports are not very reliable for these kinds of decisions. So what does was um, what we heard in the, in the previous talk already, the, the dynamic protocol detection. And I, I, I thought I'd go a little bit in, into that and explain how that works internally, because um, it's a kind of a, a new concept, I think. So let's, let's kind of go back to, to TCP. Um, so we're at this point, um, we have IP, we have TCP, we don't know yet that we are going to analyze SSL, right? And um, what Bro actually does, my previous diagram wasn't quite correct, but Bro actually does it, it first instantiates a different type of an, of an analyzer. It's the uh, somewhat oddly named PIA, the Protocol Independent Analyzer. Um, and, and that is, as the name suggests, kind of a generic analyzer, just taking the data and trying to decide what protocol this is. And, and it buffers the data as it comes in until it has made this decision. So that once it actually has concluded that it's SSL, it can kind of um, pass the data on to the SSL analyzer from the very first byte on. So there, there, there are two ways this um, protocol independent analyzer can make this decision. So one is actually by port. I mean, we're still using that. Um, so you can, and this is, this is one of these built-in functions, so you can add script land, you can tell, um, bro, okay, whenever you see a connection on port 443, then please activate the SSL analyzer. And the second mechanism, and that goes back to the signature engine, because we're actually using the signature engine for making these, these um, dynamic protocol detection decisions. You can describe um, like a binary pattern for the payload for when you would consider this SSL. Mm -hmm. and, um, I believe this uh, is a server-side SSL. Hello, Johanna can probably read the bytes directly. <laughs> so I, I copied this out of, the, of, of our standard set. So basically, um, the signature says, okay, whenever there's a TCP set, um, 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 connection and you, and you find this payload pattern at the, at the beginning, then please enable the SSL analyzer. So this is when like either of these uh, heuristics kicks in, Bro actually instantiates this SSL analyzer, puts it into this analyzer tree, and then first starts replaying this buffer of data it has already seen um, to that SSL analyzer, so that it indeed starts from the very first byte of the connection, and then from then on starts like forwarding all new TCP data coming on, on the same, coming in on this the same connection to the SSL analyzer. So and then from there it goes on to file analysis. So there's, there's one interesting piece here is that um, what if we had like more signatures, more reg register for port configurations which, which say, well, actually um, on port, uh, um, well, let's, let me turn it around. Let's say this, this session we are currently analyzing is, is an SSL session, but it happens to be running on port 80, right? So then we probably have a register for port the, um, um, instruction that says, okay, for port 80, that's probably HTTP. So always attach the HTTP analyzer. So with that configuration, um, so the, the, the signature matching on the SSL payload, activating SSL analyzer, um, and the um, 
register for port triggering on, on the port 80 HTTP, we end up with two analyzers running on the same connection. And that's totally fine. That's actually by design. So the idea is that that will always um, trace everything which kind of looks like it could be the right protocol. And, and at some point, the HTTP analyzer will say, OK, this, this binary uh, stuff I really can't parse, and will just disable itself. So, so we use basically the parsing process to uh, confirm that it's really the protocol. Um, I wanted to point out that it's really simple to integrate your own protocol parser into, into Bro, at least if you're a bit familiar with C++. So this is, this is the API um, internally um, that, that Bro expects for parsing a protocol. So you just have to fill in these, these few functions. And the just is, of course, I mean, relative, because actually doing the parsing job is, is difficult, as we saw in the, in the previous uh, presentations. But that is like, like all, how all the protocol analyzers in Bro start. And, and most of them currently use the old binpack system and then kind of call into this, this binpack generated code from, from these functions. But this is essentially the API for writing your own protocol analyzers. And there's a similar API for writing your own, your own file analyzers. It's actually quite a bit simpler even. So you just have to um, basically provide something which is to be done every time there's new data coming in. So there's initialization and, 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 and um, um, cleanup at the end. But the deliver chunk, deliver stream methods here are the main ones, either if you want to get it reassembled, the data, or, or not. So this is the API for that. Um, let me go back to the, the architecture. So the, the, the second piece I want to talk about is the, the log manager and the, and the input manager. And um, one thing, um, so first, let's, let's just show what we have. So if you, if you install Bro out of the box, these are um, the log writers and the input readers currently supported. So um, we have the ASCII writer, which produces these, these standard logs you are, um, you are used to, both the tab-separated format and the JSON format. Um, we also have an SQLite writer, which probably not many people know. Um, I believe in Ashish's talk, we will learn more about that one. Oh, no, Ashish is using Postgres, I think. There's a, there's a third-party um, Postgres module. Um, and we have input readers to essentially read files into Bro. And, and both of these, the log writers and the input readers, they come with their own <coughs> APIs again. So if you are interested in writing your own uh, log writer to interface to something else, then, then what comes out of the box, this is the API you, you implement in this case, um, which is mostly straightforward. Again, um, you can probably skip some of those for some uh, for those methods for, for some exporters, so you don't need to do file rotation if you're writing into Kafka, for example. Um, so the main one is just you get the fields and do write, and, and you do whatever is um, um, appropriate. The one thing to keep in mind if you're writing these is that, um, as I said, right, this, this stuff is actually running in threads. So your code needs to be thread safe, which can be tricky because you cannot use much of pros like, like built-in functionality. Um, the input reader API is a bit more complex because it, mo mainly because it supports like two different use cases. Um, but in the end, um, it's also um, once, you, once you have a certain input source and you want to interface it to boards, it's, it's not too difficult either. Um, I wanted to add a pitch here for, for Bro plugins because these this APIs I've shown, I mean, this is stuff which, if, if you want to put your code right into Bro, this is, you use that API, but you use the same API um, for writing Bro plugins. And, and plugins in this, I, I'm meaning in the sense of is this, this binary plugin interface where you, you compile your code independently, turn it into a shared library, and, and point Bro to it at runtime. And Bro will just pull it in as it starts up. So you can actually add um, um, like core functionality to the event engine without touching the Bro source code at all. And, and, and things you can um, turn into plugins are these, these log writers and input readers, um, the file anal analyzers, the protocol analyzers. I showed the API, also packet sources. So I mentioned at the beginning that there's NetMap, PF, Ring, uh, AF packet support. These are actually all plugins. So in the end, it's, it's, it's something you can just kind of um, load as you need it. And even these BIF elements, these built-in functions. So if you're really lacking some built-in function, you, you want to um, do something in script land you can't right now because maybe you want to interface to a third-party C library or something. Um, a plugin can provide these, these built-in functions so that you don't need to touch uh, Bro proper. And plugins can also have raw scripts, of course. And then, um, like circling back to, to Seth's talk, you can distribute these plugins as raw packages. 
so that, that actually using Drupal Package Manager, you can pull them in and, and make it really easy for people to use your newest packet source plugin, for example. So we have tried to, like over time, we have tried to kind of make these things work nicely together so that in the end, it, it all kinds of, right, right now, it kind of all converges in, in these bro packages, which, which um, tie a lot of things together, including, as I've said, the, the bro control plugins even, which are separate plugins. So we are overloading the term plugin a little bit. Um, just to demonstrate that writing a plugin is really, uh, getting started at least, is, is really easy. So we have a script for you. If you want to write a, a raw plugin, very first line at the top, there's this init plugin script that creates a complete template for you uh, with everything needed to compile a plugin. And, and this is what, what this shows. So if you look just at the yellow lines, so we generate the template, um, we configure it, we make, make, install it, and then we start bro, and it's, actually I haven't, you know, this one, but it shows up there. So this is the list of plugins bro has loaded, and, and, and the one we set up, up at the top um, shows up there at the bottom. So this is, this is literally everything you need to write a plugin. It doesn't do anything yet, because you need to add the functionality of what you actually want it to do, um, but it, it compiles and installs. Yeah, that actually already concludes what I wanted to talk about. So, so this is, again, this is the main architecture uh, broken down, and um, I'm happy to take questions about any of that. So uh, I have a question about uh, threading. Is you, you mentioned threading when you were dealing with uh, the, the log manager and input manager. Is there any threading on an, on the right side of that event engine, or is that stuff all done sequentially? It's all done sequentially. So okay. there's no threading there. We have we have actually played with threading that. It's pretty painful, and the, and the main reason is just the structure of the bro code base, because it uses a bunch of globals. And, 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 and things which aren't thread safe. So it's really hard to get it in there. Um, okay. And that was actually the point where we kind of started using, doing the, the clustering approach instead with using like separate processes, right, which scales right. just fine. I mean, it's, right. I think it's the even, the even better approach. And, and second part of the question, so everything that goes into the event queue within the event engine is also sequential. There's no prioritization of those events. That only happens in, uh, in script land processing. Is that true? Um, that is true. So, so you, you can generate events in script land, but they go back into the event queue. I, I was thinking more along the lines of the priority of, of, yeah. uh, of scripts. Uh, and there's no priority. So it's, it's basically first come, first served. Okay. And awesome. um, that is um, even independent of threading issues. That's, that's deliberate because it gives you a well-defined order on how things happen. So you can, can, can trust that stuff which is um, triggered first in terms of events is actually executed first too. So this actually came as a question for the panel, but I thought it was more appropriate here uh, for you. So uh, someone had asked, are there plans to rewrite um, the initial pre-analyzer processing in Bro to better handle non-Ethernet, non-IP, Internet of Things, ICS protocols? Yeah. So that is something uh, I would really like to see, and then maybe I go back to this one, because I was simplifying a little bit when I was talking about this. So I was saying they have an IP analyzer, we have a TCP analyzer, we have an SSL analyzer. It's not quite right. If you, if you look at the code, what you actually have is TCP is its own analyzer, SSL is its own analyzer, but IP is unfortunately still hard-coded like right into the code base. So it's not like its own class, instance, object. Um, and that would be really nice to change. So basically getting like um, modularity there and then even layer, a layer underneath for the, for the um, Mac layer, it's the same, so it's all hard-coded at the moment. Um, and this idea has been floating around for a while, and, and I've heard some interest, actually, of people tackling it um, to turn, the, to, to um, generalize our analyzer structure down to that level as well. In the case of the dynamic protocol uh, detection uh, and the, the PIA portion, what happens in the case where there's an unknown protocol? Does it just sort of fall through very quickly and then voids the buffer and then maintains connection state and logs what it can, or? Yeah, 
That's pretty much it. So, so, if, so if any of these heuristics trigger on that unknown protocol, they will, they will try, they, they will give it a shot, right, and see if they can pass it. They will disable themselves pretty quickly. If they don't even trigger, then, then there's just no, product, uh, no application layer analysis. Um, and then it essentially stops at the TCP layer level. So whatever the TCP analyzer does still happens. Um, you still get the connection log, for example, right? You get the, the entry there with the IP addresses and, then, and, the, and the volume. Um, but you don't get more. The connection log actually tells you there's the service field in there, and it tells you that is coming out of DPD. So the service you see there in the connection field is actually DPD saying, yes, this is my protocol. If you go back to the full-fledged architecture diagram, my uh, question is, uh, how would you do, you know, what, what happens there with peers? You know, what parts are in parallel? What happens, what parts are in parallel? You know, how much of that is in parallel is if you're, if you're running uh, peers? By peers, you mean other bro instances? Well, you're, you know, for example, if you have uh, uh, multiple bro instances, yeah. But, so and how do you make sure that things like uh, timers and connections are all correct? Ah, good question. Um, so what happens if you run multiple bro instances? You get like separate instances of this whole thing, right? I mean, you get like the second architecture right next to it for the second instance. And first of all, they're completely independent. They don't share state anything. This is where the communication system comes in. So through this communication process there, you would now have a connection between those two. And this is where data gets, gets exchanged. They don't automatically share like all the state down there. So they don't, they don't share the timers. They don't share um, the session table. They only share um, mostly script level state, which you explicitly mark as, as, as such. So that there's the synchronized attribute you can, can use. Or you can say, OK, the following events I want to send over to the other one. Um, but all of the, the other stuff is not shared, which is actually fine if you use this clustering model um, that, that we recommend, where you put a load balancer in front and you split based on connection boundaries. So you make sure that all packets belonging to the same connection end up in the same process. That's what, yeah, that, that, that's what I was hoping you were doing. Now I have to find out if we're doing it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so we, we kind of exploit this fact that, that, that if, if, if load balancing is done that way, we don't need to share all this low-level state, which I think wouldn't, wouldn't scale. Good architecture for parallel programming means you, don't, you can stay independent. Yep. 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 Oh, wait, wait a second, in the back. Um, can you recover from packet drop? And uh, if you can, where does that happen? Um, what's your interpretation of recovering? Uh, can you continue to monitor a session where there was a drop? Let's say you've missed, I don't know, like 10 sequence number in TCP. Mm -hmm. um, the general answer is yes, if the, pro if the protocol parser supports it. So it needs to basically, for each protocol, you need to put that logic in. So what, if, if I have a gap, in my stream, my input stream, how do kind of how do I kind of resynchronize? Um, that's the the principal answer. Um, the the actual answer is I don't think any of our protocol analyzers does it right now. So the answer in practice is we don't really recover from packet drops. That's right. SMB does it. Oh, SMB does it. Perfect. Yeah. Um, and 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 for, for for some protocols, it actually would be maybe SMB is actually an example of that where it, it, it's 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 pretty straightforward how to recover in certain situations, right? In an HTTP session, if, if you know the content length of the message you're passing right now, you know where you kind of could resynchronize next um, once you, if, if you lose a, like a package, a packet right in there. Is that what SMB does? It, it looks for the beginning of an SMB message. Okay, yeah. It's, it's different. Yeah. It just, it's because it's, it's like a SMB is broken up into a bunch of relatively small messages, so we just watch for the beginning of a message, and then it resynchronizes. If if it, it there's a there's an indicator in the analyzer that says if each flow is synchronized, and if they go out of sync, then they go back into this model where they're trying to find the beginning of a message. Yep, that makes sense. 
Spicy, by the way, has has um, so the the parser generator we, we heard about has has a built a mechanism for re resynchronization. So you can ex explicitly say, okay, so if I lose a packet like here, this is how I want to continue. Yeah, so question. So my t my question is about uh, expiry tables within uh, the script land. Uh, when you set an expiry table, does that then feed back into the timer queue? Is the first part. Sorry, I, I didn't. Uh, expiry tables within. You mean okay? Okay, you, you like putting a timer on the table to expire elements. Yeah, within Bro script, does that then feed back into the timer queue, or is that managed somewhere else? It's actually the way the other way around. So so well, it's, it's it's both in some sense. So so you you put a you put an expiration timer on the table. Mm -hmm. That internally generates one timer for the whole table, and and this timer will continuously check for expired elements. So like every I don't know what the default is, every ten seconds it will check like okay, does this table have any expired elements? If so, please remove them now. Oh, okay. So in, in this sense, it's it's kind of triggered by your configuration in Scriptland, but all the expiration happens down in inside the event engine. Okay, so it kind of ticks through and then goes. Okay, we've got these expiry events fire them off. So in a large use case, if we set um, a lot of expiry timers, is that going to slow down the code significantly? Because um, we're thinking about if there's, if it's, you know, missing packets and going, okay, should we store that some information, set an expiry table, wait, or is that going to really slow down, bro? Um, you're probably fine, though you might get some semantics you're not Quite expecting. So, so what's what's happened is so so as I said, there's essentially one timer per table doing the expiration, and it checks regularly. Each time it checks, it only checks a small number of elements in that table. So it, it's not checking the whole table at once for expired elements. It does it like piecewise, okay. and every time it expires those um, inside that piece. So that means that um, you're fine, I think, from from the perspective of bro of bro load, because there's only always a little bit of work being done every time. However, some elements may take longer to be expired. So, so basically, the expiration time you give it in Scriptland is, is a lower bound of for when the element is actually going to be re um, removed. Okay, cool. Thank you. Robin, how does the, the DPD process, the analysis pipeline, change for UDP and other IP protocols that aren't TCP? Um, not much, actually. So if, let me go back. So, so this is the TCP example, but th there's, there's not much of a change. So TCP has, like, there's a corresponding UDP analyzer, so we instantiate the UDP analyzer instead. And then there is, like, take DNS, for example. There will be, on top of that UDP analyzer, there will then be a DNS analyzer. So it's conceptually the same. Um, the main difference is probably that the UDP analyzer is obviously not doing any reassembly. So the TCP analyzer takes care of putting stuff in order and actually forwarding stuff as a stream so that that for the SSL analyzer in this case, it doesn't need to worry about packet boundaries anymore. For UDP, that, that's not the case, but it does, wouldn't make sense anyways. So but conceptually, I think there's, there's not much of a difference. Hey, Robin. Uh, back to your other slide. Uh, I, I don't want to assume, but uh, on the communications process, is that talking about uh, the inner worker communications and, and working through the proxies? Is that, is that what that means? That's correct. Okay, so, yes, my question yes, on, that's part of it. so my question on that is, is, is there a way of tuning that, and, and what is the impact of tuning it and, and looking at back pressure and everything else uh, you know, into the actual processors or the cores themselves? Mm -hmm. um, not much right now. So there's, there, there's not much um, knobs for tuning anything. So if it's overloading, it's, it's overloading. You can't do much about it other than reconfiguring your system to, to generate less load. However, um, this is true for, so what I'm showing here is, is, is kind of, I call it the old communication system. So the one we have been using for many, many years. So we are working on, on this new communication system called Broker. And it's actually already in 2.5, it's in there. It's just not activated by default. Um, Broker is built on, on, on a different communication library called, called CAF, the, the C++ actor framework. And that actually has mechanisms in, built in for back pressure, for example, for flow control. Um, so that is what we will leverage in the future for, for uh, handling overload situations better. 
Okay. And in, is there, is, uh, I saw something a while back about a uh, large number of workers and there, there's some, I think there's still some challenges with, uh, with uh, an environment where you have, you know, a, a high number of workers and, and how do you scale the, the effectively proxies to workers? Um, so I think so, so I, I so there's one there's one technical limitation. I think there's a certain amount of workers where you can't go beyond because of number of file descriptors and what select supports. I don't know if that is the tech, is it, if you're referring to that. That's, specific that's issue. part of it, yeah. And then also also the the best recommendation or best practices for uh, workers to uh, workers to proxy. Um, actually, that's something some, some some here in the audience can probably answer better. It depends a lot on your traffic and, and um, on, on the kind of analysis you're doing. So it's always hard to give like general answers for how many workers you need for a certain link. Oh. Um, but, but I'm sure if you talk to other people, yeah, the experience, I think values you get from other people's experience will be the best guideline. Uh, so it's just to follow up on the previous question about congestion, like with 2.4 and 2.5 using the current, let's say, communication, like, does Bro ever get into a state where essentially it can't recover? Like if you have just too much packets coming in and you basically just get into a state where you have to basically stop and start again? Um, so I would say at the packet level, no, I think. I mean, it will just stop dropping packets, but it will keep processing them. Um, it will put more load on the system if you start dropping a lot of packets because suddenly there's a lot of state accumulating, not being flushed in uh, like 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 in a timely manner. It will be flushed eventually, but it's it's kind of getting a lot of into these code paths, which are not like the normal ones, and that will put more load on the system. But it will recover. So if if you have this traffic spike and it goes down eventually, uh, you will lose a lot of like visibility during the spike, but it should recover in the end. Sure. Um, if I think about the communication there, I'm not quite sure. So, so if, you, if you do a lot of communication, these synchronized tables have, they have their trouble and their, 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 their problems internally. Um, I wouldn't guarantee that they will fully recover at that, at, that, at that end. So like when is basically CAF coming like as a default? Yep. Actually, it's something um, I want to talk a bit more about tomorrow in the, in, in, in the broadmap talk. But the idea is that the next uh, 2.6 release is hopefully going to be the broker release where we do the switch over of all the standard scripts um, to the new communication framework. You're not quite there yet, and it has been taking quite a while for a number of reasons. Um, um, but we, we essentially, so what we, you have currently in 2.5 is the first broker version, and we have kind of overhauled both implementation and API, API quite a bit. I mean, now porting the scripts over to this new version. So now 2.6. Okay, will thanks. Be it. Yeah, it's time for lunch, you guys. <laughs> I'm sure you're hungry. <laughs>